save the next to last, <laughs> next to last, the best. We have a great panel here. It's an international panel. We have representatives from Canada, Mexico, France, and the United States. And uh, we have five attorneys and one non-attorney. And the one non-attorney I know very well is able to hold his own with the attorneys. So let me introduce the panel. I am Marvin Berenson, Senior Vice President of uh, BMI and General Counsel of BMI. Someone asked a question about the three PROs yesterday, the best PRO. So, so <laughs> I have the microphone now, Fred. <laughs> okay. Uh, to my left is Paul Spurgeon, Vice President, Legal Services and General Counsel of SOCAN, uh, the PRO of Canada. Uh, to his left is backed by popular demand. So we could ask more tough questions of Stephen Marks, <laughs> the Executive Vice President General Counsel of the RIAA. We have Patricia or Trish Pollack, Associate General Counsel of AFM, FX Nutal, currently a senior consultant to CISAC, and again a non lawyer and expert on technology. And then we have Jose Luis Caballero, hopefully I'm not killing it too badly, Leal, Professor of Copyright and Intellectual uh, Property Law at the University of Pan Americana and a founding member of a law firm that specializes IP law in Mexico City. So with that, let me just make a few remarks. Um, the PROs or the performing right organizations have continued to have very good growth over the years. And even today we have continued growth because more and more performances of musical works are taking place. Uh, and that is because of the new outlets, the obvious ones being, you know, uh, the Internet, mobile, etc. However, it's not just those new uses of music out there, but the, what we call the traditional media, uh, broadcasting, has expanded their horizons. Yesterday you heard uh, the comment about HD radio. We also have the situation where broadcasting uh, networks, television broadcasting networks, are making their television programming available online via mobile, which is something very new. It is good for the performing right organizations because every time their music is performed, our music is performed, uh, it's being circulated and uh, royalties are being generated. However, not all areas of music are doing that well. Digital piracy, as we heard probably too many times, is causing incredible losses to the rec record industry. A report from the Institute for Policy Innovation quantified some of these losses. And some of them are really, I mean, it's, you just stop and listen to this. The U.S. economy has lost $12.5 billion, that's billion, total output annually. <laughs> Over 71,000 jobs have been lost to piracy. $1.6 billion has been lost to bootleg physical CDs. That's, again, billion. And $3.7 billion has been lost due to illegal file sharing uh, and illegal downloads. Reports have indicated that the recording industry has lost approximately 30% decline in its annual revenues. And there's one little interesting statistic before we start. In a recent, well not recent, but in a Billboard article, uh, it was claimed in that article that in 1991, there were 4,700 traditional record, chain record stores in the United States, which represented 47% of the retail market share of the, in the sale of recordings. Now, there are only 1,400 traditional chain stores with a market share of 6%. It's a dramatic change. While downloads of music have basically compensated to some extent and have dramatically increased, Statistically, only a small number of these downloads uh, are downloaded illegally and were purchased. Most were either taken from someone's CD or downloaded illegally via peer-to-peer -peer service. So with that as a backdrop, uh, and uh, th this panel has lots of topics which have been covered by everyone else. That's the nature of going next to last. But we're going to try to some, uh, something a little different, go into some other topics in addition to the ones that you've heard about. So I'm going to ask the panel, we'll start... Uh, uh, basically all the way down at the end we'll ask Jose Luis and working our way back it has been, sta it has been stated by Rick Rubin uh, that the, subs the subscription model is the only way to save the music business this is something different than we've been talking about the last couple of days we're talking about downloads so 
Uh, if you know you would like to comment on that, if you don't want to, it's up to you. So, yeah. Thank you, Martin. Well, actually, uh, as uh, we discussed among ourselves yesterday, uh, this uh, seems to be a problem basically on education. Uh, people still thinking that uh, music is a product that has to be free, and therefore that uh, file sharing among themselves uh, isn't absolutely worthy at all. Therefore, if uh, the question is if uh, just a subscribing system would allow to adequately regulate this issue, the question for myself would be yes. Yeah, we'd like to differentiate different, different services. Uh, the ones we know today, like Napster, Rhapsody, where you have DRMs and everything, uh, I, I kind of question their commercial viability and even Napster and themselves, the knowledge that it's got a huge, huge take up. I think it's a maximum of three to four million subscribers worldwide, which looks good, but it's not a huge number. Um, but yesterday we had a very emerging, very good emerging discussion about the uh, based on the broadband. Uh, so the, the basic principle would be that you apply a fixed fee to every broadband connection and you have like a mandatory subscription to as much music as you want. Uh, now while it seems like a, a pretty attractive model, uh, you've made some calculations whereby uh, by year 2010, if you actually just take a $4, $4.2 actually over every subscription, broadband subscription worldwide, largely make up for the whole of the music industry revenue. But even going back to like the revenues we enjoyed like 10 years ago. Uh, and that includes record labels, revenues, publishers revenues, society's revenues. Uh, so it, it looks like a very appealing model. But when you dig a little deeper and you try to look at how it should, should be structured and what are the conditions for such a subscription system to work, uh, there come some real tricks. Might think that you just you know take the money and let people play with peer to peer systems, but I'm afraid it's not going to work because you cannot monitor peer to peer systems and you have to distribute, so you have to monitor. So you have to think a lot beyond the apparent easiness of the subscription model, but I believe it's worthwhile going further and digging into that. Thank you. Trish? Well, I guess uh, nobody really knows at this point what the successful model is going to be. and or the predictions that it's going to be subscription. Other people say no. Uh, in the end, consumers still are wedded to the idea of having something and keeping something. And time will tell what the model is going to be, I think, from the point of view of performers. And I know that we'll talk about this a little bit more later. Um, it's, it's difficult because it's a time of transition. Um, but the, the, the core principle, I think, for us has got to be that as the models develop, and as we see what works and what doesn't work, that we are all um, very cognizant and very dedicated to the idea that whatever the model is, we have to find ways to have uh, uh, a fair compensation system for the creators, for the songwriters and the performers. There has to be um, robust reporting if it's a service model or a subscription model so that we know what's been used and we know who to pay. And we have to have a real dedication to making sure that people do get paid who help to create the music out there because, um, as uh, uh, Charlie said earlier and as other people have said, if we don't compensate the creators, we will not really have a creative product that we can really call on. Steve? Well, I, I think the subscription model is a pretty compelling model. I mean, I'm a, a Rhapsody subscriber. I mean, it's a great service. And I think while the, the, the subscriber base is small, there's no question about it, if you talk to people who subscribe, um, they, they just love the service. I mean, it's, it's one of those services that uh, doesn't have a big user base yet, but um, the satisfaction rate for them is, is tremendous. Um, and I think that the success of the subscription model is going to depend a lot on you know, the delivery of it. And one of the things that has uh, handicapped it so far is you know, the lack of mobility uh, and the lack of interoperability with, with iPods. Um, and, you know, we saw that just in the last week, uh, TiVo owners having Rhapsody, for example, delivered to uh, you know, their TiVo boxes. Uh, things like that, I think, are going to be necessary for the subscription model to, to really have a chance to 
have mass uh, mass appeal. I, I think a lot of people just don't understand what it is either. Um, and if you if you look at the there's not been a tremendous amount of marketing behind it, and the marketing that, that it has been done has kind of been confusing. And I can remember Napster's that first ad that they bought during the Super Bowl about three years ago, and it was so confusing. I mean, they had this guy who basically had Napster equals 10,000 CDs or something, and, and it, they were trying to get the point across that you know you have access to a, a complete library without having to go out and buy the, the CDs individually. Um, but but it just didn't quite work in terms of getting it across. That said, um, uh, my sense uh, is that there's there's no one um, uh, magic solution to uh, you know, the, the, the transition here from traditional models to new models. Um, if you look at, at at charts in the past, you know you basically had a growing industry, and that growing industry was due to one product. There was one configuration. One um, going forward, I think that what you're going to see is instead of having that one magic uh, solution or that one product or service, you're going to have to have many successful services that built on top of each other add up to the, uh, you know, the, the kinds of revenues that, that continue to provide the incentives for uh, artists, songwriters, and record companies to invest their, their time and money to create the music. Cool. I, I don't think um, that it, subscription will necessarily be the solution um, to uh, what's ailing the, the record industry, but I have to say it was, it was quite refreshing for me anyway to read Rick Rubin as the head of a major uh, record, uh, multinational record company to, to suggest subscription because subscription connotes access. So moving from selling a product, that discussion we had in the last panel, going from a model where you're selling something, a physical good, to allowing consumers to access, because that's all that's all uh, uh, people want to do is they want to listen to music. It's about the experience, folks. It's not about having a piece of plastic in your house. And that's what the young people now know. They know that really, I mean, I know you can get into a debate. There's still people that have to have copies of everything in their house or access on their hard drive. But the day's going to come when you're going to be able to go to a huge remote server somewhere and get whatever you want, whenever you want, on whatever device you want. That day is coming. And I think when Rick Rubin said subscription, I saw kind of a seismic shift in, in, in thinking that maybe they're thinking that this is the business to be in, not so much as in the, the, the uh, products business, was referred to this morning, but the rights business. And they have a right, and that is the right of the master recording. It's, and in, in Canada, they have the right even to, to perform, uh, to control the performance. Um, so I think there's a recognition there of, of that, and I think that was that was a positive thing. But it certainly won't be the. Uh, there'll be a lot of different ways of, of monetizing um, the uh, music music, as we've seen. The music business is a business of nickels and dimes. It was when it started, and it has been, and it always will be, in my view, nickels from this and dimes from that. Uh, it won't be from one specific source. It's all kinds of of, of streams revenue streams that come from different uses or expectations. I gather we have a definite maybe. Is that true? <laughs> okay. Let's switch uh, topics. Uh, we've heard the last day and some touched this morning, I believe, on the need to change the attitude of consumers. Uh, most, most people in the recording community believe that it's crucial to change the attitude of the consumers from music should be free to music has value. And my question to the panel is, is this really, is it a realistic goal to achieve this when you have at least a generation, maybe a generation and a half, that has grown up thinking that it should be free? I mean, is this a goal that the panel thinks can be realized? And if you want to speak about any, uh, any attempts by your various organizations to change their minds, I'd love to hear it. So, Paul, since you started, uh, since you finished, start with you. Well, I, I think you know, consumers, I think it was Eddie Schwartz, said they're, they're the fans, they're the people who enjoy the music. And somebody else said the other day that consumers, I think it was you, I'm not sure, consumers are just as greedy as, as maybe some copyright owners are. The fact is everybody wants to get as much as they can for as little as they can. Um, and uh, I think a lot of it has to do with uh, attitude of consumers. And getting back to what I said about the fact that I always like to look at the cable television and satellite television uh, 
model as, as an interesting model. I'm not saying it's necessarily out, but um, people accept that. I know there are people who run up the, the uh, telephone pole and hook up their cable illegally, and they have illegal dishes. And in Canada, we have what we call gray market uh, uh, people who subscribe to direct television and even black market uh, Dishes where they decode the signal illegally. You don't have one, do you? What? I don't. No. Okay. I, I don't. Um, but that's a good model in the sense that <coughs> here you have, in effect, somebody providing programming, musical, audio, visual, whatever, movies on demand. And now they've got, of course, they've got remote PVRs, which, again, getting back to my comment about a huge database that allows people to access at any time they want and watch a movie any time they want for a fee. It's an incredible value. That's the value that consumers recognize and are prepared to pay for in the, in the television context, satellite television context. And I think, uh, unfortunately, right now, because of, of P, P2P, uh, there's, there seems to be, a, obviously, a lag here. Uh, technology has not been able to keep that a closed shop. Whether it ever will is another question. Most people, I think, think it won't. But uh, I think the jury's still out on that because of the, of the nature of the business and, and uh, you know, I, I, I read recently that Columbia, I think it was Columbia Records that did a study on this from uh, students in college about whether it was okay to download, okay, whether it was okay, whether it was stealing or whatever else. And the vast majority, the vast majority, not a small percentage, said, no, that's not stealing, it's okay to do that. And these are kids who are going to be, you know, in college, going to be out there pretty soon in the real live, real live world. So, I, again, that's why I asked the question, do you think it's realistic? Steve? I, I think the, the question is, um, uh, or the answer to the question is really more complex than, than is it going to change get from legal to illegal to legal. Um, we've got to all recognize that we're operating in a completely different marketplace than we have traditionally with, with music. We consume music differently, and we have uh, competition for not only attention, but also for the dollars. Um, I know that you know, when I bought an album, I went home, I sat in front of my stereo, I put it on, I opened the album, I sat on the floor, and I read from the beginning until the end every word of every song and every line of every liner note. And then I probably, and then I, if I really liked it, I'd just do it again. And um, people just don't consume music that way anymore. They just don't. And We've got to. So part of it is is legal, illegal. But I, you know, and I think a lot of students, you know, they rationalize what's stealing and what's not, and, and other things like that. But I think it's going to be up to, uh, you know, us as creators and, and the business people in the industry to figure out a way to uh, take people's you know passion and love for music um, and bring it, uh, offer it to them in a way that. Uh, is, is how they want to consume it and, and in recognition of the fact that, you know, I mean, you didn't have, you, you've got video games, you've got all kinds of other things that compete for, for the dollars, and that contributes to, um, uh, you know, the problem, so to speak. It's just really what the reality of the new marketplace is. So. Well, whether or not it's realistic certainly is a hard question. I, I think I'd like to talk a little bit about um, some of the particular views that performers have about this issue of, of consumer education. One thing that we always find is the most incredible misconception that people have generally, um, and that is that all performers, all musicians, um, all recording artists are rich celebrities being followed around everywhere they go by paparazzi. And it's astounding to me how, how widespread that misconception really is if you do polling and testing, you really find that people do believe that. And that is so incredibly untrue. Um, and that is something that uh, performer groups do need to work on and do need to try to work on so that people understand that even though they get music by pushing a button, um, the, the music isn't made by magic. I mean, pushing a button maybe is magic, but the, but the music isn't made by magic. It's made by real people who are, for the most part, ordinary working people. There are always some who become wealthy celebrities, and that's good, and we like that, but um, by and large, most musicians, whether they're session musicians and session vocalists, or whether they're uh, young and emerging or trying to emerge uh, uh, performers, recording artists, they really 
um, uh, are uh, doing very well if they are making them just a regular kind of modest middle class living. And, you know, they do, and most recording artists really are just making a middle class living. You can be incredibly talented and you can be extraordinarily hardworking um, and you, that's not enough. Those two things alone are not enough. You also need luck and for all the stars to align right and then if, if all that works out for you, you end up just making an ordinary middle class living. Um, I mean, unlike John Simpson or Charlie, I didn't start out in any way, shape, or form as a musician. In fact, I have so little musical ability myself that I am probably the only person ever um, to have been kicked out of accordion lessons because of my utter <laughs> inability to play any piece of music. So I personally am totally awed by, by the ability of people to write songs or to actually play instruments. Um, but it's but it's very hard work, and the way that people make modest livings in the music business as creators is often just to patch together lots of different income streams, so that they're really um, uh, uh, entrepreneurs or small businesses themselves. So one of the things that um, that the unions have done, performers unions and the songwriter organizations, SGA and NSAI is to um, work together, we did filed an amicus brief together to explain the, um, the fact that although consumers like to think of themselves as the David against the Goliath of the music industry, we said, you know, hello, reality check, the real Davids um, are, are the performers and the songwriters. We're the people who um, are small businesses ourselves and have to work so hard to just make them and we need to explain that message. I think the other um, misconception that consumers have, especially young people, is that if they pay for music, it isn't going to benefit a creator. It's not going to benefit a, benefit a performer if they even think of a songwriter. It's not going to benefit a songwriter. And we need to make sure that people do, in fact, understand that when they pay for music, it does benefit performers. It helps to fund recording helps to keep an industry alive that in fact does employ creators, um, not as many as we'd like, but it does. Um, it does create um, what we call in, in unions special payment fund payments or contingent scale payments so that session people earn more money. It helps to get uh, licensing sharing and, and it does benefit performers. Um, and then I think the third thing is that if, if we're trying to teach people that we're ordinary and we need money, and that if they pay, they, that money will benefit performers. We have to make sure that it's not just a message, but it is the reality. I, I mean, it has to be true that when people pay for money, that money is, in fact, being shared with songwriters and is, in fact, being shared with performers. And we have to figure out ways to get the money to them so that we're not just blowing smoke or putting the performers and the songwriters up in front of the industry without backing up the, you know, the, the claim that... Uh, payment is going to benefit them, so there needs to be uh, you know, transparency and royalty accounting for royalty artists. Um, there needs to be uh, sharing of all the new media kind of income streams. Uh, the, the record companies need to straighten out their relationships and keep good relationships with their unions. Um, they have succeeded in uh, achieving a recording code with the musicians' union, but they are in difficult negotiations right now with AFTRA that agreement on a fair basis um, so that the, the, the session folks are being covered and recording artists are getting their health coverage through AFTRA. Um, and then when we're talking about all the new media and new devices, we have to make sure that the sharing mechanisms really are there and people realize that they're there. Some things maybe, at least in theory, are easy, like um, a subscription model where you can share a part of the per subscriber fee. Ad supported uh, uh, service or other kind of service, uh, you can do percentage of revenue sharing with your artists. But if it's going to be something like the total music model or uh, the, the satellite radio devices that uh, involve maybe a, a model that would be a per device payment to a rights owner, we have to find ways to make sure that that gets shared with performers too. And that may be a little bit more difficult. 
to figure out how to um, how to distribute and how to share because uh, while a subscription service or a, a P2P type model, you can get the usage data and you know it's being used and therefore you can figure out hopefully how to how to share it and how to distribute it. If it's a per device uh, payment that's going to a rights owner, uh, you know, and the rights owner doesn't know. How, what's being copied or what's being listened to later on the device, then how are we going to share it? We have to figure that out. Thank you. Uh, FX, uh, just to refresh your recollection on the question. I remember the question. Okay. Should we change strategy for consumers? Uh, and I would like to strongly disagree with everybody everything I've heard so far. Um, I think we should change our own attitude first. Uh, we send very, very mixed messages to, to the consumer. Uh, the consumer is not bad as such. We are consumers, and we are bad, bad, bad. <laughs> uh, but consumers have been very, very good in the case of ringtones. I mean, they, they, they put lots of money on, on these 30 second little clips. I mean, they made billions of dollars for the industry. So it's just what we present to the consumer that makes them mad. But they're not bad themselves. We're bad. If they're acting in a, in a in proper way, in proper way, it's because we haven't prepared the ground for them to actually enjoy. And I heard this morning um, so much blaming on the others, like you know, publishers blaming the labels and the labels blaming the ISP and the ISP blaming the mobile operator. And we should blame ourselves. And it's about time that we sit in a room and really talk about our problems before we send out the message to the consumer. One of the things I said, you can hold your own with uh, the lawyers, you just proved it. Uh, okay, uh, Jose Luis? father launching into a few files uh in the files. So I think this is an issue that has been targeted into the decent percent of all the people who say this are teenagers, people who are in the So when you ask if uh, we should change the attitude of consumers, then we have to focus on that. that kind of consumers uh, lack of any kind of uh, economic capacity to pay for most of uh, the products they are getting through the net. So my views are that um, I mean, this is really an indication of problem that um, since the net is full, uh, it has to inform the value of, of this product, of the music, of the music, of the music. Which we need is to share on the net. And that uh, uh, they, they really harm people. And they have a feeling that they are harm absolutely anything. They have a feeling that they are not doing absolutely anything. Uh, they are not doing anything wrong. And uh, I think we have to share that we can't exactly do in the sense that uh, they are doing wrong. They are hurting people and they are walking not only the artists, but the composers, and the producers. Those are the job for the job. Okay, and I just want to say, we've all heard this expression, it's hard to compete with free. And uh, it's a question of changing attitudes, and it's just an uphill fight. Uh, Paul? I just wanted to add something. According to the OECD, this is an amazing statistic, uh, the, uh, they, they found that Canada has the highest per capita incidence of unauthorized PDP in the world. That's kind of interesting. It probably has something to do with the fact that we're heavily, uh, we have a lot of broadband penetration in the country. But that being said, another interesting statistic that um, the um, in private copy collector did a survey a, a year ago, and they found that most of most Canadians, at least the ones they surveyed, in, uh, Canada, were in favor or thought it fair that a levy be, be uh, uh, applied the sale of blank media, such as CDRs. So hey, there's a little bit of a disconnect there. In other words, most people think it's that, that creative people are deserving and they should, if there's a blank media and they have to go to the store and buy it, they should have to pay, there should be some levy on it. So I thought that was an interesting statistic that we discovered in our, in our research. Thank you. Uh, I want to change the topic now, move along to enforcement of rights. Uh, the PROs, the Performing Right Organizations, have for many, many years enforce the performing right in musical works by commencing copyright infringement suits. 
against users of music, basically businesses that use music. And uh, we're generally very, well, we are very successful, don't lose these cases. Uh, but generally there's sympathy, less sympathy uh, from the public when a business is being sued than individuals. So Steve, this is your time to come up to bat. Okay, uh, the RIA has commenced many, I think thousands of lawsuits, right, uh, against individuals. We've been talking about this, you've heard this. And obviously, probably everyone here knows that recently, like I really want to get to the, a, a poor little single woman, single mother in Duluth, Minnesota, you obtained a judgment for $220,000 or $222,000. Um, now, that's good and it's bad. Obviously, the judgment is good. It shows that uh, you're entitled to the, you know, this kind of money for infringement. But there's another aspect of this I'd like to bring out, and that is, do you, when I'm asking you, because this involves your clients, you know, it, it, will this result in a groundswell or a public outcry uh, about such a, the magnitude of this judgment that people will go to Congress and say, hey, something's really wrong here where the big bad record companies could gang up and get, you know, a poor little, you know, woman from, a single mother from Duluth to have to pay this kind of a judgment and would it result in possible congressional action because of that? Uh, this, um, the, the calls by Consumer Electronics Association and other um, organizations for reducing the statutory damage uh, awards as possible awards have been going on for a long time. And uh, not only a long time ago, but also very recently. Uh, so I don't think that, that this will, uh, you know, it's going to be a kick to some sleeping dog. Um, I, 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 you know, will it stimulate additional, will they try and use it uh, or misuse it to support their arguments? You know, probably. But, um, you know, I think the, the key thing about that case is not, not that, you know, there was this judgment of two hundred and some thousand dollars that we're actually going to collect because I don't think we expect us to be able to collect that judgment. But um, the, the thing about it that I think is, is so important is that you had a case that went to a jury. This was not a mm -hmm. judge making a decision based on the reading of some kind of statute. This was a jury of her peers that listened to all the evidence and decided that not only should she pay something, but she should pay that amount. We actually, in the case, didn't even ask for a specific amount. That's it completely up to the jury. And if you, if you read the, um, uh, some of the articles that have come out where the jurors have spoken after the, the case, they've all said that it took them three to five minutes to agree unanimously that she engaged in infringement. And it took them then the next four hours to figure out how much it should be with some people feeling that she should have, uh, uh, we should have been awarded 150000 at the, the, the top limit for each one. So, um, uh, you know, I, I think for us, the, the, the case is, is going to be less in the long term about the effect on people making arguments about statutory damages and hopefully more about, you know, people focusing on the fact that we have 12 regular people well, let me just follow up on not necessarily that suit, but you've been bringing these suits, the RA has been bringing these suits for a couple of years now, I think two or three years, I think it is. Uh, four. Four. Time flies when we're having fun. Uh, but I guess my question is, uh, have you seen a decrease in, I will refer to as illegal downloading as a result of these suits? The answer is yes and no. We've seen a decrease, a dramatic decrease in the growth of, um, uh, of illegal downloading, but not a decrease in the actual number. And so uh, before the lawsuits, um, about 7 million people were actively downloading, is that the number that was around? Um, and there were 30 million broadband users at that time. Uh, four years later, you have 80 million broadband users gone from seven to eight million. So you've had, you know, a very incremental increase in the actual downloading from seven to eight million people after downloaders, um, despite the fact that you had this broadband growth um, that was, you know, very dramatic. And, and look, you know, you know, piracy is the killer app for broadband um, uh, when, it, when it's 
started and, and even today to a large degree, whether it's music or movies or something else. And so, um, you know, uh, on the one hand, we, we, we see some benefits in, in what's happened, and we, we think that's a direct result of, of the education and the, and the uh, lawsuits. Uh, on the other hand, as we've all talked about uh, you know, today so far on, on, on both panels, we've still got a, a level of piracy that interferes with the ability to uh, launch new, new products with these things. Just following up, can't let go. Um, and this is, we all suffer from this, it's called bad PR. Um, the, uh, the attorney in this case in Duluth, I think it's Richard Gabriel, uh, asked, was lead counsel for Capital Records, and he asked Jennifer, I guess it's Parisa, I don't know if that's Parisa. the Parisa, uh, the head of litigation for Sony BMG, if it was wrong for consumers to make copies of music which they have purchased, even just one copy. And she, her, Jennifer's response was, when an individual makes a copy of a song for himself, I suppose we can say he stole a song. Making a copy of a purchased song is just, quote, a nice way of saying, he steals one copy. Now, uh, I mean, um, just your reaction. I mean, I, I know this could be a landmine. The PROs have had, you know, mishaps like this also. So yeah, I mean, the answer is easier than one might expect. I mean, the truth is, is that Jenny really just misunderstood the question that was being asked of her. And that's the truth of it. And the industry position has been. I mean, we have it up, had it up on website musicunited.org. Um, uh, for, for many years now, talking about, you know, what you can do and what you can't do as a, as a general matter in practice. And we've had up there all the time making copies for your own personal use. It's not going to be a problem. So Jenny what, didn't mean to say anything contrary to that. She kind of heard something that was different and uh, was kind of unfortunate that came out uh, you know, the way it did. But um, uh, the important thing is that the industry... The industry, because there's no record company that I'm aware of that's ever sued anybody for you know, making a copy of, of a CD that they own. It's just not something. There's always a first. But, <laughs> I just want. It's not for I, I just want to ask if anyone in the panel has any comments on this, or should I move to the next topic? Yeah, maybe just a, a small comment. Um, uh, we need to say that I think there's so much energy that went into uh, limiting the access of music. And the uh, record industry bid out on its own has really spent millions of dollars and you know, trying to design guarantee technology, protection technology, invested in a limiting factor. And on the society side, we have more of view that you know, we should make the works much more available. I mean, the purpose is to get the works out there, to get you know, visibility, to get people to actually use it. And just, just to, to, to see if there's ways to actually convert all this energy and all this money that goes into the, the negative approach convert this into basic steps that are positive. I'd be very, very happy to you know, have an offline discussion with the record label to, just to actually see how we in, in turn depend on each other and how you know, the act of one uh, actually has um, action from the other. Uh, we very much take that on. Uh, well, I mean, this is obviously a, a big topic. I, I, I think that um, the way I would describe what's happened so far, it's not so much about limiting access, because if you look, for example, at the rules that, that uh, come along with the, the Fair Play DRM for Apple, nobody's complaining that they can't make enough copies. And you make as many copies as you want of any one song, you can make up to 10 playlists or whatever it is, and, and we've surveyed people. I mean, there's no issue with the, the kinds of access that's there. And, you know, DRM does play an important role in, in development of other business models like the one we started talking about, which is subscription didn't have some kind of access control, then you wouldn't be able to offer a subscription service. Um, and that's exactly the kinds of things that are done in the, the cable and satellite TV world and, and with other copyrighted work. So, um, you know, there, there has been a lot of, uh, I think, confusion between DRM and interoperability. Um, and, you know, some of it was, was spurred by Steve Jobs' thoughts on, on music from February or March or whatever it was, and you know the, the, the real issue is uh, that that consumers have problems with and have confusion over is the fact that you can't 
you, you know, you can't have the device of your choice work with the service of your choice. Uh, and that's really more of an interoperability problem. DRM is not the problem there. There, there are technologies that can, that can make DRM interoperate with each other. The, the, the issue more is, uh, you know, having business partners that license in a way that consumers can use the iPod, for example, that they bought with the Rhapsody service or some other kind of service that they want. Well, this is a good segue because the next, next topic is DRM. And Mike Steinberg, associate who works with BMI, showed me something that on his BlackBerry this morning. And there was an announcement stating that Viacom, Walt Disney, Microsoft, and others have agreed to set guidelines to protect copyright online. However, Google was not part of this. Okay? Uh, the agreement is to use technology, technology to eliminate copyright infringing content from being uploaded, which will prevent material from being accessible. So with that in mind, uh, and since everyone's been talking about DRM for the last day and a half, uh, I want to turn to Paul Spurgeon, because I know you have done some work in this field, and if you could just quickly, concisely, let's talk about what DRM is. Well, I think Richard Owen spoke to it uh, yesterday, um, and I, I think I have to really stress what he said was important. Uh, DRM as TPM is very different from DRM as RMI. TPM is what? TPM are technological protection measures and, and, and RMI is rights management information. They're two very different things. Unfortunately, they've been lumped in and they've been given this uh, pejorative, uh, RMI at least has been given this pejorative uh, notion by, by, the, by the public and the press. Um, just to be clear on this, and I think it was said yesterday, DRM as TPM is anathema to performing rights organizations. We, we never really relied on TPM. We've been providing access to music since 1851, when the first Performing Rights Society was established. And as as um, as uh, um, Jim Griffin said, I think everyone would agree that we have made the transition from the acoustic to the uh, electric to the digital era. We've been able to license all those uses. You know, we're having troubles now with peer-to-peer, -peer, but we're we're licensing all these uses. And DRM, TPM, at least. We want the music to be played. It's out there. We have to seek the users and license them and enforce the rights that we have. And that's what we, we've been doing since 1851. We did it in a cafe in, in, on the Champs-Élysées uh, when, when uh, a composer sued the, the bar for, for playing his tune and didn't pay his, his restaurant bill. And we did it when radio went on the air. And, and David Baskin, or, or I think it was Mario Bouchard, mentioned that, that uh, the Copyright Act of Canada was established in, in, in 1924. So Kent's predecessor was established in 1925, and the CAB was established in 1926, the Association of Broadcasters. You can see there's a progression and a reason for all these things. Um, so the, uh, the fact is that we don't, we don't rely on TPMs. We know there's music. If we want people to play music, we want to license it, we want to get paid for it so we can pay the creators, the composers, the lyricists, and the publishers for the music. The music. And so from that point of view, we, you know, we really don't care one way or the other. RMI, on the other hand, we think is very important because it allows us to identify uh, the usage that is occurring in the marketplace to find out you know, what, is, what is being played so we can pay the right people. That's very important. So we should make that distinction. Play into SoCan and Blue Hour technology? <laughs> and we do have, uh, even, even now we're using digital audio identifiers, obviously, as the other societies are, to identify works that are performed on radio so that we can we can uh, virtually do a census of music use on the radio. The little listening devices, which, as you know, uh, as soon as the, the song is uh, is played, a machine, in effect, a, a, a logarithm, will figure out what the, what the tune was, and we know exactly then uh, what was played and who wrote it, of course, and, uh, and we can play the right people. FX, I know, in the case of BMI, and I believe in ASCAP, they don't use uh, the uh, TPMs. Uh, do you know of any societies out there? Prefer, you know, performing rights or something. Now, TPMs are very seldom within reach of our world. Um, as Paul said, we were more focusing on the RMI right. uh, of the equation. And quite importantly, in the sense that uh, rights management information is really a fundamental tool for us to identify how works are being used. And in spite of us being called collection society, uh, we forget that we're also distribution society. Distribute and we have to identify. 
and the, the core of our business is really based on the quality of the metadata that you can get out there. And this is built part of the RMI um, equation. And we're, CSAC has really developed lots of technical standards with IBD and ISO, uh, with the record industry, uh, under the GDEX project, uh, which is a standard for exchanging information between societies, record labels, and ESPs, and getting the information back. And just to give you an example of the impact it has on our daily operations, is um, GDEX is the, the channel by which we receive sales information for online sales. And we have a message called the DSR Digital Sales Report. And these messages for one store for one month is about 17 million lines of post. And that's the data we get, the raw data to do the distribution. Now, out of these 17 million lines, 50 are just uh, metadata of some recordings and underlying works. And the, the problem we have is we don't have any identifiers that are really broadly so we, we're, we're very good at designing the standards, at setting the standards, um, but we were very bad as an industry because, again, we rely upon each other to actually use them and make them um, into our daily operation. So to counteract um, the, the poor quality of the data we have, then we have to have a huge amount of data. It's a huge, huge waste uh, that is currently happening today. We're trying to improve this a lot, but as a CSAC or as a society alone, we can has to be every chain of the value chain, every element that has to you know, pass on the metadata, qualify the metadata, make sure that we have a consistent system. Fine. Now, Mr. Apple, another Steve, right, said that uh, there should be no DRM. Well, we could call it the TPM, of course. And uh, looking at the record companies, we have some that have now introduced or have said they're going to be introducing non-DRM non -DRM music. Uh, other record companies have not uh, come to that light yet. Uh, whether they will or not, I have no idea. So let me ask you, I'm, again, I'm not going to ask you, Steve, I'm not going to ask you to disclose any confidential information. You wouldn't anyway. But what is the positions of the, the different positions of the labels? Uh, will they come to one view, in your opinion? And uh, why can't they agree? Well, um, we're not supposed to sit around and agree because the antitrust laws, most of the people don't look very good in orange, so they <laughs> try to avoid that. Um, I, look, I think what you're seeing in the market is basically different companies experimenting with, with different models, and that's just how the market works. Um, uh, how one company might, you know, what one company might view as, uh, as the way to go may be different from the other, or, or it may just be a matter of timing. Uh, but, uh, you know, there, there's, there's no really industry position on it. This is just the marketplace of work in a, in a very, you know, fast-paced uh, environment right now. Um, okay, I'll hold my comment back. Uh, Trish, do you have any, from the performer's view, do you have any uh, comment on this? Well, I think that um, one thought is that, uh, you know, Paul said that uh, musical works have been very good at licensing and wanting to get that get the music out there and have license through all the stages of technological change. Uh, but musical works have always had a performance, right? And so they've always had a model of licensing performances. With the sound recording in the United States, the lack of a performance right in the sound recordings, I think, prevented that um, kind of model development. And it became an industry that was based on selling physical products and on the reproduction right and not on um, now that we have the digital performance, right, it's an industry that's got to uh, go through the, the, the exercise of learning how to do that um, and finding ways to do it that work for all the parties in the industry, and we're doing that. Um, but as, uh, as the music business for the sound recording moves from uh, a, a product kind of business into a service business and a, and a performance business, uh, one thing certainly that we need, and we've heard about it a little bit yesterday and today and probably will more this afternoon, one thing that we really need in the United States is a performance writing sound recording that goes beyond just the digital performance right, but that applies to over-the-air radio um, so that when HD radio comes online, it won't have a uh, 
competitive advantage over the digital services that now pay for performers, <coughs> copyright owners, um, and so that we will be able, as uh, U.S. performers, finally to be able to go uh, overseas and, and repatriate some of the uh, royalties that are collected under the European and other foreign systems for the broadcast of U.S. recordings and then are not paid over to us because we don't have um, And I want to just, well, I, I, I've gone out, but I want to take one second to agree with FX, um, you know, along these lines, that really what we need is, you know, more services that really work for consumers that people like and that are easy to use and that provide us the necessary information then to distribute and to share uh, the remuneration that's collected under those systems. And, you know, we need more and more and more and better, better, better. You know, I, I do understand your uh, desire to have a performance right and sound recording going just beyond where it is right now. Uh, I will say this much, because uh, you, want, you want to collect the monies in Europe. Uh, the recent decision that came down vis-a-vis uh, -vis the performing rights on performing and downloads, uh, basically we could f be facing the same thing, not getting the money from, you know, our sister societies, because they're not, you know, they're not going to, we're not going to be paying them for these performances, and they're going to say, well, we're not going to pay you for the performance. That'll be a national treatment, though, for right. I think you'll be right. fine on that. Well, you never know. You never know. It gets to a point, there's so many, so many exceptions in the United States copyright law that uh, we keep hearing, why should we be paying you? But going back to this issue about, you know, um, the DRM, uh, and I'm going to open this to the panel. I'm going to start with FX first. Uh, but number one, do you act? This is a series of questions. You can do it in any order you want. You don't have to answer all of them. Uh, do you see the TPM actually working? How long is it till someone hacks one of these systems? If it's actually employed, is TPM an efficient way to combat piracy? And effectively, is it not too late for these TPMs to come in when you have record companies that open up the door to the barn? And I have a feeling if it takes off and they see they're going to make money, and no one, they're going to be under, the other record companies will be under pressure to have non-DRM music. So, uh, perhaps? Yeah, I mean, DRMs, they're usually dead the day they're born. Uh, one of the key underlying principle of DRM is you can always break them on the first day. It's what we call the analog code. So you can actually record what you're trying to do. And I'm always amazed by how much effort we're, we're putting in trying to lock everything. Like the fair play DRM, you know, you're not allowed to copy more than five times. On the other hand, there's a huge door open because then you can make non-DRM CD copies as much as you want. So I failed to really understand the exact purpose uh, of the DRM. Is it like a limiting factor? but you're not really trying to close the doors. So my, my feeling is that it sends more of a mixed message to the consumer. We're telling him you can't copy, but actually you can. Okay. We're not telling you how, but you can copy. So I, I don't believe the RMs have a very, very long future in the music industry. It's different from the other uh, But actually, the music business, I don't think it has a, a very, very solid future. most of uh, what FX has said, but uh, I'd like to add again what uh, we discussed yesterday in the sense that uh, DPM or DRM, DRM uh, have to be uh, viewed in terms of uh, also the consumer rights. And uh, for example, in the case of uh, the Mexican copyright law, in terms of what the limitation to the exclusive rights they mean. And uh, there is a big discussion whether all these uh, technological measures are attempt against the right of the consumers or such. And uh, I don't know, Marvin, if, if it's the right time to discuss a particular issue that uh, came out in Mexico a couple of years ago or regarding enforcement or should we move on and then we'll discuss it later? Just, uh, we, we, uh, time is, we still have time. We still have time, but no long dissertation. But go, please. Okay. Um, Remember a couple of years ago that uh, IFPI, the International Federation of uh, Phonogram Producers, uh, requested uh, our services in order to produce some opinion regarding if Mexican law can really enforce uh, music downloading through the Internet. Uh, an opinion was released, and uh, although there were several doubts regarding uh, the real um, um, statute or, or status of Mexican law, uh, IFPI decided to proceed. 
uh, they used a very simple method to identify who were downloading music through the net through a specific software program. And um, once they saw that uh, a huge amount of uh, data was being downloaded, they could identify exactly if it was a musical file. After that, uh, they were able to identify the IP address of the people that uh, were downloading that file. And after that, uh, they were able to request the ISP uh, to provide the real name and address of the, such people. When uh, such piece of information was uh, all gathered, then um, uh, an administrative uh, um, um, lawsuit can be filed before the trademark office, which in terms of Mexican law is the one entitled to known or to receive this kind of lawsuits. Um, once we did all these uh, experiment, uh, we went uh, to speak uh, with uh, the authority. Uh, they were um, at the end, at the beginning, reluctant to go on with uh, all these um, administrative uh, lawsuits, but at the end they were convinced that um, the phonograms producers were right, that uh, all their rights were being violated, and therefore that uh, they should act in terms of the copyright law. IFPI provided training for several inspectors. Some people were brought from different parts of uh, the world. And uh, when we were almost ready to launch the first action, suddenly and uh, without the previous notice, um, on the, this paper appear on the front page uh, what uh, in Spanish is Preven lluvia de amparos, licito bajar música, puristas, which in, in English means uh, there's going to be a lot of appeals and it is legal to download music. And uh, on the three different uh, pages, which are two different pages, was uh, released all this information and uh, we are certainly unaware who leaked all this information. But there was opinion of senators and uh, many people uh, related uh, to the consumers association stating that uh, all this activity which was going to be displayed by IFPI uh, was some sort of an instruction of privacy and therefore that uh, the Mexican authority was not enabled or, or to produce any kind of um, investigation or to sanction in any way or manner. Therefore, the HubCap the hub program, I mean, was aborted. At the end, nothing happened. And um, this is how, at least now, in Mexico, the problem of music downloading is perceived. Thank you. Does anybody have any comments on the questions that I asked, or shall we move on to the next topics? Panel's decision? Move on? Okay. Uh, what I'd like to do is actually read a quote, uh, and then have... Uh, which will actually lead into the next two topics, which we can handle, hopefully, relatively quickly. And this is a quote. Big media describe DRM as digital rights management. However, since its purpose is to restrict you, the user, it's more accurate to describe DRM as digital restrictions management. DRM technology can't restrict users' access to movies, can, excuse me, can restrict users' access to movies, music, literature, and software. Unfree software implementing DRM technology is simply a prison in which users can be put to deprive them of the rights that the law would otherwise allow them. And it continues. What does this mean for the future? No fair use. No purchase and resell. No private copies. No sharing. No backup. No swapping. No mixtapes. No privacy. No commons, I assume they mean creative commons. No control over our computers. No control over our electronic devices and conversion of our homes in, in, into apparatuses to monitor our interaction with published works and websites. Now, okay, this may be a little bit off the deep end, just a little bit. But, but it raises two, two issues that I'd like the panel to discuss. And one is the question of fair use, and the other one is privacy with respect to DRM. Most countries have some sort of fair use doctrine or laws. If TPMs are used by a copyright owner, how will fair use be accommodated? 
and with respect to privacy, the question is obvious. It's a possible invasion of privacy through the use of DRMs. And really, let's do, if we can, quickly, let's go through the panel for comments. Great. No one wants to talk. Well, I, <laughs> I just want to know if you want to go first. No, you can. Um, first of all, that's, that's, that's hyperbole, that, uh, in my view, that, uh, that quote. Um, as far as, um, as far as the issue of uh, privacy, we have privacy laws. So we have privacy laws, so we'll, we'll apply them. If, there's a, if someone has a problem with, with some uh, aspect of, of uh, uh, DRM, then uh, privacy laws would, would uh, come into effect as well, and the courts would have to consider that. Um, I don't get too excited about that. On the issue of fair use, I, I know there are a lot of people saying that uh, they, they have legitimate uses, they want to be able to use a copyright at work, and they won't be able to get at it because it'll be locked up. Uh, I understand in the United States, we don't have uh, a DMCA in Canada, but I understand in the United States there are provisions that allow users in certain circumstances to make application, use works to break codes or whatever. Mm -hmm. I don't know to, to what extent they're effective, but I understand it is working to some extent. Um, is it a solution? Is it the best solution for the future? I don't know, but uh, that's one way of doing it. Um, so as far as those two, and there are other issues as well, beyond privacy, I understand, you know, things, free speech, things like there's all kinds of other laws that are uh, implicated by, by uh, DRM, but uh, I don't get as excited as that person anymore. I don't think it's, as, as, uh, you know, it's it almost sounds like chicken little, uh, you know, the sky is falling. It may one day, I mean, anyone else? Uh, I would just add, I think it's much ado about nothing when it comes to music. I mean, uh, music, the, the, the restrictions that have been that are part of any DRM today um, are basically the most modest of any copyright industry exists in terms of if you look at other copyrighted works, whether it be software or, or anything else. So it, consumers have the ability to, to do what they want with the music that they, they purchase. It's just simply not an issue. Anyone else? But just a quick word maybe because I believe DRM is fair use on all those YouTube exclusive. <laughs> The reason why the, the, the fair play DRM is in itself couldn't work very well. Uh, had to have this huge hole in there because you have to be like very uh, Steve uh, mentioned to me that he has to leave at 12.30 sharp, which is in about five minutes or so. Uh, and we do have another topic to discuss, but I want to give someone an opportunity to uh, go on. I mean, ask questions of Steve. So does anyone have any questions of Steve? I can't believe this. The last panel you were put on. Okay. Well, I, you know, I think that I don't know what you're referring to specifically. I mean, the only thing that can't, has come up so far is uh, you know, something that, that iTunes uh, did or is allegedly doing in their files. Um, I, you know, I, I there are um, there's information you can put in a file that you know becomes business enabling. Uh, for example, if you purchased a file and it's marked in a certain way. And authenticate it, that person may be able to get bonus content that's available by that particular artist. Um, so I think there are other reasons why you might include information uh, other than, you know, merely kind of the deterrence of, gee, I don't want my information to get out on the, the net if I, if I put it up on a P2P system. Um, and I think that companies are very focused on offering things like bonus content. Um, you see, you know, new products like Warner's MVI products where 
you establish, you, you, you buy the disc, it's got certain things on it, but that artist can then, through that continuing relationship, do it, and there's a certain authentication that needs to take place. You can imagine that that could be in a, in a digital file as well. So um, I, I think that to the extent that there's the discussion about it, it's more on the, the business enabling side than anything. Any other questions from the audience for Steve before he leaves? We got off easy, Steve. And let me thank you for participating on the panel. Have a safe trip home. Uh, so uh, lunch is not ready. So no, no. <laughs> we just go a few more minutes and then we'll open it up for questions. Okay. Uh, another issue on our on our uh, brochure says. We should be discussing collective administration of rights. Okay. Now, obviously, BMI, ASCAP, CSAC, and SOCAN have successfully used collective administration of rights and a blanket licensing uh, regime for many, many years. Uh, I was going to ask uh, Steve about what he felt about that for the record companies, so we'll ask other people what they feel about it for the record companies. Uh, and I will probably look to you, Trish, to some extent here, since you're involved in that end of the business. Uh, do you see this actually happening, now that he's gone, we could really talk about him, uh, about interactive downloading, or what, what has currently been reserved for the record companies not to agree to uh, go through sound exchange? Let's we'll start with you. Well, I, I think we wish that the record companies would be a lot more interested in doing collective licensing, or blanket licensing of interactive uses uh, than they have been. Um, I think overall performers very much would like to see the coverage of the Digital Performance Rights Act compulsory license broaden to include more and more of what is in the gray area between interactive and non-interactive uses um, or, or to even subsume the interactive altogether. Um, I mean, I, I know it's a copyright truism that compulsory licensing is bad because it doesn't generate enough value. Um, but to tell you the truth, the uh, experience of performers over the last 10, 12 years since we got the Digital Perform Performance Rights Act has been very positive with compulsory licensing um, and together with the collective management. Um, when uh, Back in 93 and 94, when the legislative impetus was uh, ongoing to, to get the digital performance right, the unions worked very hard to say, um, some part of the new digital right really should be a compulsory license and there should be a mandatory split between the copyright owner and the performers so that we know that performers will in fact get paid and uh, congressmen and hill staff said to us oh no 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 that's an issue for the market and we said oh no 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 the market really doesn't work uh, for performers in this business um, and Compulsory license will, will be the thing that will help us to be sure that we get paid. And when we talk to artists about whether the interactive part, which was going to be remaining in the exclusive rights purview, um, should also be uh, subject to a, a mandatory split in the statute and whether we should advocate for that. Back in the early 90s, um, what people said to us is, and we think that the exclusive licensing will generate a lot of money, it will be very high value, and we're a little nervous, um, we royalty artists are a little nervous about giving up our uh, ability to use our market power uh, to, to get a share. We're, we're not sure that we want a statutory share that will cap what we can get. Well, you know, here we are 10, 12 years later, and uh, artists are saying to us, gee, everything ought to be in the compulsory license because our experience has been with the compulsory license we get a certain statutory share and we don't have to fight uh, the record companies about the share. Um, the, it, as a practical matter, the way that share has uh, worked out is that it is in effect inalienable because we've reached agreements with the record companies, first union agreements and then later sound exchange agreements and now uh, uh, it's part of membership for rights owner and sound exchange that they won't use uh, the compulsory royalties for recruitment purposes. Um, and we've got direct payment. That also was first through uh, our private agreements. Now it's in the statute. So uh, the collective licensing leads to certain shares. 
uh, artists really get the money, and they get the money directly. And um, there is the efficiency of having it all be in one place, all the administration in one place, rather than company by company, uh, keeping records and distributing. We get it all in one place. And the, uh, the last thing that has worked very well for us and that we like very much in the compulsory license and the collective management of the compulsory license is uh, uh, performer uh, control or joint control over the collective. Sound Exchange, as John was saying yesterday, is jointly run by uh, uh, rights owners labels, including the indie labels as well as the major labels. They make up half the board together, and performer representatives make up the other half of the board. So we've been able to be um, very focused on trying to ensure that the collective agent uh, does meet the needs of performers. Uh, uh, we work hard to make sure that uh, uh, rights on, uh, that the performers can be found, that they're located, that uh, when the data is bad, uh, which it often is, as John said, we will go past just the surface data that we get from the uh, services, but we will also do hand work and research. We will uh, go to other organizations and do member matches. Um, we'll go to conferences. We'll, we'll reach out to try and make sure that we pay everybody that we possibly can pay. So that's worked well for us. This, uh, before I, I, I'm not going to give my visceral reaction to uh, compulsory licensing. Hopefully someone else on the panel will. But with the board... Steve would say, Steve. well, you can get a lot of those advantages from blanket licensing, and, you know, we're not close to that well, either. That's, that's the next uh, question. You know, voluntary blanket licensing um, can, can get a lot of the same efficiencies and, uh, of collective management, and that, that can work well, too. Just one quick question. Is your, your board, as you said, made up of performers and, and what, record companies, I think? Who is it? Who's on the board of but, Sound Exchange? The Sound Exchange Board is an 18-member board. Nine of the board members are rights, uh, rights owners, copy, sound recording uh, uh, copyright owners. Uh, six of them are either major label or RIAA representatives, and the other three are indie label representatives, and they are very vocal and active part of the Sound Exchange Board. The other nine are representatives of artists or artists or organizations. Do you actually get anything done? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I yeah. mean, with, with, that, with that makeup of the board, it would be hard to get a decision, right? Um, well, we fight sometimes. Uh, we definitely fight, but no, we, we do get things done. Okay. Yeah. Any uh, comments, uh, Paul? Well, I was going to say that uh, in Canada, perhaps that's where the similarity ends. I mean, there is an organization that was mentioned yesterday, the Neighboring Rights Collective of Canada, that administers this right, the performing right in the sound recording for it's the makers of the, of the recording and the performers featured and all the others. Um, the difference, big difference between the United States and Canada is that in Canada, this right is negligible as against terrestrial radio broadcasters as well as public places, bars and restaurants. And uh, I think you mentioned first earlier that you don't have that right in the United States. It's only on the digital domain that, that it applies. So this, that's a fundamental difference. Now, in, in European territories, my understanding is it also applies, as it does in Canada, to, to terrestrial and to public places. So I think in, in that case, U.S. law is, is aberrant, and, 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 and actually in many other ways as well. Um, and so I think that has... That in labor law, too. Yeah. And um, so uh, that has to be kept in mind. That there, there are a lot of differences. I want to, just for the audience, I have to do this even though I'm going to get booed. Uh, Paul once told, uh, said to me, you know the difference between Canadians and American, you know, United States citizens? And I said, what, Paul? He said, in the United States, you have the right to bear arms. And in Canada, we have the right to arm bears. <laughs> we, we're in the nature in Canada. <laughs> uh, I just, in fact, uh, uh, no, no comment? Do you have any comment? Actually, in Mexico, we don't have a statutory weight, and therefore, we don't have a compulsory license system. Therefore, I mean, although I don't work for any collective or society, uh, evidently the black license system seems to be the one which is uh, working fine up, up to this time. I mean, I, you know, my opinion, I guess, uh, since I come from a performing rights organization, I think collective administration of rights is always the way to go. It makes it easier for users and it makes it easier somewhat for uh, 
music creators and performers as well as uh, publishers. But, uh, I assume. Go ahead. It's tailor made for uh, the fact that there's many millions of works and many millions of individual copyright owners and many millions of uses or transactions. And how else can you do it? It's the easiest way to provide access in a simple way. Performing rights as I say, it. since 1851, they've been doing it. They did it in the acoustic, they did it in the electric, they're doing it now in the digital. It, it is the, it's, it's not perfect, but it works. And it's owned and operated by the people who own the rights, the, the creators and, and the publishers. Um, I, I do have one question um, to, again, FX, uh, concerning, basically, you mentioned DDEX before. Uh, do you, I mean, I obviously, I believe you're a proponent of DDEX. Uh, do you see DDEX as an answer for collective administration? And I want to go one step further, and then the panel could join in after you speak. And that is, does, do you see DDEX helping, if we can ever solve the issue of peer-to-peer, -peer, will they be, will DDEX aid in the ability to track this information? Uh, Chris Semenita was supposed to speak this afternoon about DDEX. Okay, then. I believe he's not here, so I won't steal his show. Oh. So I can give you just a two-minute run. He will be here, or? Okay, so just okay. one minute here. Um, yeah, DDEX is a very, very promising sense that we have nothing else available, I and mean, we absolutely need to get all the system automated. I mean, getting a license through a phone call and getting the, the sales report through a Excel sheet running on a USB key, I mean, that doesn't work anymore, obviously. And the power of DDEX is that it's been designed by all the, uh, the parties involved. So it started off as the RAA uh, IPIB project, or the MSPB. And then we invited in the DSPs, so uh, on board you have uh, Apple, you have Microsoft, you have AOL, you have Real. So the real actors are really uh, acting parties. Uh, so I think there is general buy-in to the system. Very, very soon we'll find out that there's no other way of doing it but this one. So I think this is really the, the strong power behind DDEX. Now, DDEX will not curb down to the purpose. purpose. Uh, DDX is really for the back office. It's a business-to-business -business tool. Uh, we don't have any business back to the lunch, so let's start questions. Thank you. Now I think this is the moment we've hopefully all been waiting for questions from the audience. Any? Did we really put you guys to sleep? Come on. Yes, sir. Wait for the microphone. If not, I get uh, guillotined. Um, I couldn't bear to let you not have someone say something, so in the interest of your um, welfare. So, um, Peter, Peter Jenner from the IMMF uh, Music Managers. First point, which is coming from uh, the earlier panels, I think it's really interesting that there are so few performers or writers here. And also the reference to how poorly they get paid. And I think that that is because essentially the writers and the performers get what's left. And uh, all the rest of us here, including the managers, are taking bits as it goes along. Varying size bits. And then what's left over gets through to the performers and the creators. And I think they're extremely alienated from the processes that we have here these sorts of discussions and I think this is very worrying because it seems to me that clearly what is happening is that there will be a new bargain coming into the, with the new forms of distribution of music that the values added by the various parties are going to change the record companies historically did an enormous amount. They invested in the recordings, they made the, the copies, they distributed them, they collected the money and all the rest of it, and they were in an extremely dominant position. Clearly the value that they add in the new technology is going to be very, very different. And that's why there's such a huge, you know, bear fight going on. And it seems to me that the performers and, and, and the writers, uh, 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 so collectively I call the creators, really better get their 
if I may be so rude, get, it, get their shit together. Because otherwise they're going to be cut out in the same way. That the people who are sitting in this room will carve out the rights and the new order to their advantage. So I think this is not just a question of fair shares. It's a question of the issue of legitimacy which has come up. The whole question of why people feel that somehow it's all right downloading stuff and not paying for stuff because there's a concep conception that it's just going to the middlemen. It's not going, it's not actually getting to the creators. Patricia's point, very little of it is actually filtering down. And I think it's very important that when we create this new more, this, the, the new bargain that is going to have to be made, we better make sure that the consu that the creators are on board and that they support it and they support it vocally because they are the people who will deliver the political support and more important they will deliver the consumers support and, uh, and so on thank I, I, I agree with what you're saying and I think someone brought this up yesterday so I wasn't going to bring it up again but you know the, issue, the concept of Radiohead just giving you know deciding they're going to give it away or they're going to pay what you want they're doing their own thing, cutting out all those people along the chain, and they will, you know, if it, you know, this could be a wake-up call to this whole, to the whole music industry, because you have a situation where I could do it myself, and a lot of people could get cut out of the chain, and which means, though, that the performer and the creator might wind up getting a lot more. That's true. That's true. Any other questions? Yes, sir. I had a comment in mind that fits, and it, and it is a comment. Uh, I was going to say that uh, I, my name is Dennis Magnuson, and I teach copyright law in, uh, in Canada and have done since. We worried about whether the roar of the Tyrannosaurus Rex was uh, performing work or not. Um, but as I listen, I th thought to myself, so often we hear thievery. Uh, and we try to uh, tell the consumer that uh, he, he is a, th a thief in his downloading of digital works. The consumer is not quite that naive. The consumer knows that taking uh, a download of a piece of music is quite a different thing from stealing the composer's car. There's one car. If I take the car, the composer doesn't have it anymore. If I have the exclusive possession of the car, no one else can have the car. That's just not so with downloading the piece of music. Everyone else can share in that music, despite the fact that I've taken it. In a sense, the composer still has his music. He can listen to it. He can take the pleasure that he's, he's the composer of the music. Uh, it's not the same thing, and the public is is not so naive as to think that you can simply argue that there's got to be a system of property rights that is identical to uh, the system of property rights for chattels and real property. It is different. Uh, and the consumers will demand that you respond appropriately with this difference. Further, the consumer hears that the artist uh, is entitled to deep, deep respect in our society, and this is partly why. We have to be very careful that they're properly rewarded. That's true, but being an artist who's a central figure in our society has another aspect to it, too. We can think back, I think, anthropologically to tribal times. The, the, the composer um, around the fire uh, captures the experience of the tribe uh, and voices the tribe's experience for the tribe. Um, we have deep respect for our artists because they, they voice the societal experience and so what they voice in some sense belongs to us too, that is the whole community. We get to share in this. We've got a piece of that and it doesn't belong exclusively uh, to the composer. Finally, uh, thinking about um, uh, pricing, uh, the, the marginal or cost of downloads is, is near zero, that's the market price. Looking at the demand curve, when you have a price near zero, quantity demanded is very high. 
Uh, if that price goes up substantially, we may find that uh, demand shrinks uh, appropriately. But the collateral observation is that the public understands, I pay for my computer, I pay for the electricity, I'm doing all the work. Uh, the real marginal cost of my taking my copy is zero uh, for the producers of, of this music. Now, I'm prepared to pay something, but in the modern world, the marginal cost of my copy ought to be very, very low. I mean, this stuff ought to be damn, damn cheap. Now, and and the, the, the community of composers can get rewarded by the fact that we're selling billions of copies at tiny cost. And you're not going to get away with any other model. The public won't let you. And what I just finally, sorry for going so on, but what I see here is, is people with vested interests fighting it out and, you know, it's explanations that this is, this is inevitable. I understand how this happened. But in a way, I, I, I recall Schumpeter, change, destructive change. You guys are being squeezed and people outside this room don't give a damn, right? This is the way the world is. This is the way the world ought to be. Get your act together or you're going to be screwed. And nobody outside this room is going to give a damn. Well, you know, you, it's, you, make a, you make a very valid point because um, many years ago, I think it was in Maastricht, that Sisak had a uh, Congress, and Esther Dyson was on a panel. And uh, most of you know Esther Dyson from the Electronic Frontier Foundation, right? EFF? Yeah. And um, she got up before this august body, which was a little hostile, I guess, and she got up and said, where is it written that a songwriter should get paid? Why? The songwriter should give it away for nothing. She should be happy. And while, you know, you had the copy left there for a while, regretfully, this is, Esther Dyson is not some kid in college just downloading music because they figured they're going to get a freebie out of this. This is the mindset of the other people that you're talking about. So I agree with you. We do have to get our act together. And since lunch is not ready, I've been told to stall a little bit, so we have to come up with a couple of more questions. <laughs> yes, sir, microphone. Uh, Eddie Schwartz again at the Songwriters Association of Canada. All uh, we composers and artists want to just throw a few more pieces of meat on the fire for us, and we'll, we'll be okay, probably. Um, uh, this whole debate about DRMs and RMIs and TPMs and all the other letters. Uh, I don't know, it seems absurd to me. I, I have to say, uh, there are 79 million, according to the research that the Songwriters Association has, has done, 79 million unique copyrights that are now being traded uh, or shared, depending on what terminology you like, on the internet. 79 million unique copyrights. It's the entire repertoire of Western music. It's already out there without any technical protection measures, without any RMI. Uh, is this debate not, I mean, are we not, uh, somebody used the word Tyrannosaurus Rex, I mean, this seems to be irrelevant to the real world, and I guess it speaks a little bit to your point as well. Um, that's a genie that I can't see you ever putting in the, in the bottle. You can't take those 79 million copyrights off the internet, stamp them with whatever seal of approval the music industry decides is right, for whatever reason, and put them back out there again. It's just never going to happen. So I wonder if the panel would, would comment on the fact that there's 79 million horses out of the barn already, and what do you do about those? Sure. Yeah, yeah, one comment, because, um, I mean, with all due respect, if we, if we let this the way it is, we're never going to build anything. I mean, the iTunes store holds, what, 5 million original copies. If you want. Now, these are the seed copies of the seed that we only sell. We make copies out of these. Now, if we were to populate these early 5 million original copies, Properly with good metadata, I mean the rest would flow back to the same stuff, and you can do a proper business. So I think we nevertheless have to make a real effort that for the next generation of technology of whatever we have a really clean system. We can't just let go. But but just like broadcast, if you go to a system as Paul was saying, where you, you basically look at peer to peer as a collect, you know, you, you put together a collective that treats it uh, the way we treat the broadcast industry now. We have no control over what flies around, we just collect money uh, from from internet users, and we monitor the usage, and then we make a distribution based on that, and 
it's fairly divided to the artists, the writers, the record labels, the publishers. Uh, in other words, the system's already in place. All we need to do is monetize it. And why don't we just... I, I mean, again, we're never going to replicate 79 million songs that are, that are free-flowing on the Internet. Why not just monetize that activity and then find a way to pay the rights holders just like the performing rights societies do? But the, the metrics are very different. I mean, traditional FM radio stations, they broadcast roughly 800 songs a year. That's the rotation. Okay? So basically what you, you have to do is identify 800 songs, and you can do your distribution. You, you, you distribute 90% of the revenue you collect. On the online world, it's just the opposite. Uh, the, what we call the long tail, so, so people are just downloading like a, a few songs in, in many, um, many examples. But you know, thousands and thousands of people are just downloading that single song. And we have to identify it, and we have to pay the author of that single purchase. For us, we don't do our job properly. And if you want to do this, work in this new metric, you have to have the, the RMI system. We really do need it. We're not in the FM world anymore. We're beyond that. But, but again, a performing rights society is dealing with the same thing. I mean, some, we all know that some few performances may fall through the cracks. It's an imperfect system, but as a composer, I take I go to my imperfect mailbox four times a year, and I take my imperfect check and I take it to my you know very imperfect bank, and I support my perfect wife and two perfect children. <laughs> so your your wife must I mean, be I mean, in the I mean, audience, right? <laughs> why, why should this why should this why should this this idea be held to a standard that no other organization or system in the music industry is held to? You will never, uh, probably, or, or maybe you won't, or maybe the technology will exist where we can track every single uh, file share. But even if we can't, even if we can only track 90% of them or 95% of them, I, I mean, that's as good as the performing rights societies uh, do now, and I think it's perfectly acceptable to the vast majority of people. So I just we think it's something we have to look at seriously. There are a few more questions, and it's incredible. So far we've had two Canadians. We're about to have the third. And Americans are being uh, shot down here. David? <laughs> Again, it seems to me that it's a question of political and social will. If you set yourself up to compound pharmaceutical products, pills, and sell them out of the back of your house, it won't take long before you get a visit from the authorities either clapping you into jail or shutting you down. You cannot make and sell pharmaceutical products on your own that have not been subject to FDA or Canada Health and Welfare approval or the same in any country. Why? Because society at large has decided that we don't want untested, unsold medicines being sold as cures for diseases, etc., etc. You can think of a dozen other examples. Very simply, the case has been made and politicians have been convinced that it is important to take action to regulate an industry for the greater public good. The situation of, I find it personally, sorry, I find it very offensive to suggest that creators are just replaying back to people their own stories. Write the songs yourself if you feel that way. The public did not create the songs, the creators did. Without them there is no music and I think it's, 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 it's naive to suggest anything otherwise. The problem that is with us today of file sharing is not irresolvable because file sharing does not happen like rain from the sky. It is a technologically driven process. But it will not be successfully addressed until our politicians successfully address the technologies. As I said yesterday, lumberyard, gasoline, rags. The cure is to regulate the use of the Internet to deal with a problem that is before us. I guarantee you, no other industry would suffer this kind of abuse for long. And this is what we should be truly united on as an industry. Labels, producers, performers, publishers, everyone. Because otherwise, it will all fall apart. And he's absolutely right. You've got all those tracks out there. People aren't being paid for the majority of them. It's all happening because the carriers are not being held accountable for their actions. How many other industries get away with it? How many unlicensed airplanes are there out there? How many unlicensed pharmaceutical makers? Every other industry you can point to examples. What, you chop liver? You want to buy some snake oil? <laughs> <laughs> I, think, uh, I think there are two more questions. The gentleman in the last row, and then we'll get to you, Pat. Well, uh, um, my name is Jimmy Borja from the Philippines, some writer. I'd like to speak from a standpoint, from the standpoint of pure writer, meaning uh, a non-artist writer, because oftentimes we're really the ones who are the bottom of the food chain all the time. So, um, 
this is by way of reaction to the, the views of the gentleman from Canada as erudite as his views are but uh, 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 it, it is us who don't really benefit at all from illegal downloads they don't, uh, those who do don't even care who wrote the song you can find our writer's name on on the as well in there and also um, would you allow a person to live in your house if you're not there for free something like that I don't I'm not even sure if that kind of an analogy uh, holds but uh, that those, those are just my feelings as a, as, as a songwriter thank you Pat? Oh, oh you want to comment sure, sure. yeah I, I wanted to respond just briefly to the um, comment about census reporting versus sample reporting in a sense uh, I mean yeah it's true that it, it, perfection is perfection and very hard to reach but I think from the point of view of performers um, you know it, it, we're not very contented with the notion of just easy sampling or relatively easy sampling because it's going to leave out a lot of uh, niche artists and, and genres that ja our jazz members at the AFM um, uh, complain and get concerned because they say they don't get picked up sufficiently in the samples and they don't get you know appropriate shares uh, for, the, for their musical works rights and uh, you know we Perfection may not be achievable, but we can do a whole lot better than we're doing now to make sure that we know really what's being used and that the right people are being paid. And we'd like to see you know, more rather than less of that. In fact, um, I, I mean, really just can't underestimate how much work there is that needs to be done to um, put into metadata more and better information about who's the rights owner and who's the performer. Um, one of the things that the, that the unions do is uh, supervise a fund that is a collective management fund essentially for session musicians and session vocalists and as bad as the data is for featured artists and rights owners generally there's no data out there anywhere about who the session people are they also are creators and deserve to be paid and there's a tremendous amount of just hand work and research that goes into building up a database of them and you know we, we want to see more and more and more of that data collected rationalized and, and organized and automated to the extent it can be automated so that more people can get paid and more people can earn that bit of an income stream that they can put together with everything else they do and survive and create. I, I think that uh, with respect to getting census data, we're getting closer as technology has advanced. The gathering, the RMI, is getting better. ASCAP, BMI, and you heard CSAC said they have their technology to track music now. Is it perfect? Nothing's perfect in life. But we're all getting better at tracking it, and this hopefully will lead to what you know, you know what you're looking for. Pat? Thanks, Marvin. Uh, I want to applaud the panelists. Uh, it is all about metadata, and as David said, it's a, technolo it's a technological problem, and it's going to be um, uh, fixed with a technological solution and I believe that that techn technological solution has to start with the people who make the records. The information has to be put on the record. The tracking devices are here. We have to encourage those people who are the vehicles for the distribution of music to funnel that data back to the whatever agency, be it the, uh, the sound exchange or a performing rights organization, so that all of the participants can get paid appropriately. Now, some people say, well, but over the life of something, it changes, and that they may have a different publisher, they may have this. There are all kinds of processes that we can set up to catch those that aren't the same. Um, the fact of the matter is uh, we should move toward a census quicker. Uh, the record companies and those who make records ought to be putting all of the data on. It's not going to solve the problem we have for all of the music that's being downloaded illegally and where people aren't getting paid. But for every day after we have the metadata, for every day that goes by, the problem gets smaller and smaller. I don't know how much music from 1890 or 1900 is being downloaded without payment. And so maybe the problem lasts a while, uh, but the fact is we should put in a solution that takes us from today forward. Thanks. Oh, okay, what, this, is, this is the last question. I'm sorry he had his hand up, I think, before you did. Ron Gertz, wait for the microphone. Uh, 
This is kind of a ridiculous discussion. Several points. For, Thanks, for, Ron. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> First of all, the, the only technical protection measure, uh, they don't work. The only DRM that works is the moral right of attribution. That's what the artist cares about. That somehow when someone is listening to something, they can figure out who the source was so that they can buy it. Secondly, when we talk about uh, census versus sampling, well, the reason, there's a reason why sampling works. Because there are lots of st statisticians who have been doing it for many, many years. They get employed because it works. The societies use it because it works. Nobody wants to spend a dollar twenty to distribute a dollar. Okay, metadata on albums from record companies, nice, but how are you going to have metadata for that person who put up his uh, cell phone and recorded uh, uh, a song at the Metallica con concert? Can't do that. But sampling and in, in those kinds of environments can pay Metallica that way. The key to all of this is making sure, I'm going to upset a lot of people, but I've done that before, that, that we don't have national monopolies. The reason why it works in the U.S. is because there are three collectives and they compete against one another. You know. So anyway, I said that yesterday. Bye. Okay, uh, I want to thank uh, the audience for putting up with us. I want to thank the panel. And I, ha I have the distinct honor of saying, eat, drink, and be merry. <laughs>